Hello, everyone. Welcome to uh, Yad Sarah webinar on a day of Yad Sarah. I'm Perry Rosenfeld, and I'm going to be the moderator of this session today. I'm a former uh, board member of American Friends of Yad Sarah, and delighted to be here today with an exciting panel of individuals who are volunteers at various locations. Uh, throughout Israel. Uh, and I'll uh, be introducing our panelists in a moment, but I, I want to take a, a second just to, uh, first of all, thank you all for making time in your busy days to uh, hear about Yatsara and the amazing work that they do. Uh, I just want to like remind those of you who um, may not know all of the details that Yatsara is Israel's largest volunteer staffed organization and they provide a wide array of compassionate health and home care services for people of all ages and um, all backgrounds. They have special programs directed for older adults as well as children with disabilities. And I uh, personally am very proud of Israel, of uh, Yad Sarah's reputation for really uh, serving all people in Israel. Um, all the diversity uh, population, all the po diverse populations that are there. And just to give you some sense of how big the organization is and how ambitious their goals are, they provide free services to with over 6,000 volunteers. You're only going to meet three of them today. And they have more than 100 branches across the country. And uh, they uh, serve over 420,000 people each year. So that's pretty remarkable. And uh, we should applaud all of, the, all of the volunteers and particularly the three that are here today. Uh, so let me take a moment to introduce our panelists. And uh, first I'd like to introduce Leah Palma. Uh, Leah uh, founded the Yerucham branch in 2014. She's a native of London. And she and her husband uh, have been instrumental in developing the program in Yerucham. Um, as you may know, that, that city, that town, development town, is in a, in a location that doesn't have access to many healthcare resources. And so Yad Sora really serves a very vital purpose there. Um, and uh, she's recently been able to grow the program to having over 25 volunteers. And we'll hear more about that later. And uh, on a personal note, Leah has recently completed her degree in pharmacy, congratulations. And um, she hopes that that pharmace pharmaceutical background will help her improve access to care for her clients. So welcome. Um, Elliot Nemetsky, I have to give a special shout out because Elliot Nemetsky moved to Israel seven years ago from Brooklyn. He was a, a member of my community and uh, we actually went to his uh, auto repair shop for many years and was very satisfied with the service. Uh, <laughs> upon, upon arriving to Israel, uh, he heard that Yad Serah uh, was in need of volunteers to do repair work on some of the equipment, particularly the wheelchairs. And uh, though he was a new Ole and struggled with the language, he knows enough about uh, machines and equipment that he um, came to the plate and he's been doing a great job um, helping out with uh, uh, repair, repairs of equipment. And we'll hear more about some of those stories. And then finally, Tzvi Swerdlov, he is in uh, Natanya's Lending Center. Um, he made Aliyah in 1969 from the United States, from Boston, and he moved to uh, Netanya after serving in the IDF for uh, several years. And he uh, also does some translations 
um, as part of his volunteer work at Natanya's Lending Center. Um, he lives very close to uh, Yad Sara in Natanya and therefore he is there a lot and he seems to have many different hats uh, that he is able to perform many different jobs and particularly now during COVID-19, his uh, very flexible skill set seems to have come into um, help a lot, um, taking in uh, taking on jobs that when people can't show up. So kalakavo to all of you, and the work that you do for Yad Sara. So just to kick things off, why don't each of you tell us a little bit about yourselves and how you came to uh, you know be involved in Yad Sara? So let's start from the top. Uh, Leia, why don't you tell us a little bit about your adventure? Um, hi, Perry. Hi, everyone uh, who's listening. Um, first of all, thank you very much for the lovely introduction. Um, as you as you said, I ran the branch in in Yerucham. Um, Yerucham's in the the Negev, the southern set, the southern section of Israel, um, and uh, a little bit forty minutes away from Be'er Sheva, if that helps anyone put it on the map. And in general, there's very poor access to healthcare in Yerucham. So as soon as I made Aliyah from London, I, I got married and uh, moved to Yerucham. And it was one of the things that really stood out to me was coming to this place where where your your local physician um, might not have passed his test, for example, which that's a true story from Yerucham, which, is, which you would never see in Tel Aviv or Jerusalem or almost anywhere else in the country. Um, but that that's the kind of thing which happens in your home. And um, and so it became immediately very clear to me that healthcare is a real need in this area. And um, we felt, well, we knew about Yad Sara because my mother-in-law runs the branch in Big Chemesh. Um, so it was really a family mm -hmm. business. And Rebecca Palmer, for those of you who know her. Yes. And, uh, <laughs> sure. And, um, and my husband has volunteered there through his childhood and teenagers. And when we got married, we decided to put aside the portion of our wedding gift um, towards setting up the branch of Yad Sara. Um, we set it up in our house to start off with, which was perhaps not the most ideal location. It was on the third floor of a block of flats. We had three rooms. We had a, a kitchen lounge, our bedroom, and the Yad Sara, and the Yad Sara lending center of Yerucham. And um, we became known as Yad Sara of Yerucham. People see me in the street. They say, oh, hi, Yad Sara, right? And they, <laughs> before they say, oh yeah, Leia. Um, <laughs> and, uh, and our family, our family's really uh, grown with the with the Yad Sara. It moved out of our house um, after about two years. It became clear to us it was much too big to be just under under us. And uh, and now it's 25 people in a fix in a location opening well, except for maybe in Corona opening five days a week and serving the the whole population of Yerucham and the the Bedouin neighbor the Bedouin neighbors. Oh well, that's like. Uh, I'd like to come back to some of the some of these uh, some of these topics later. Uh, thank you so much, Leia, and and Elliot. How about you? Uh, how did you get? Um, tell us a little bit about yourself and how you got involved. First, I have to um, tell Leia that was unbelievable what you did. I've been to Yerucham. It's I understand what you're saying, and it would be nice if it would grow more because that's to be a nice area. How did I get involved? As you know, I was an automobile mechanic, so I speak mechanic. I don't speak Hebrew particularly well, but I know when a wheel goes crooked, I know how to fix it. And I decided that would be a nice place to work. And I went up and first the woman, I'll tell you the truth, the woman wasn't so thrilled that I didn't speak enough Hebrew, but she took me upstairs and it turns out there's a number of people there who speak a little bit of English. But I understood what was going on and right away I, I got into it and they looked at me like there's something wrong because they never saw anybody. I work a little bit differently and they never saw, I don't like to sit still. So if you give me a wheelchair, I have to fix it. I, I don't take lunch. I don't take breakfast. I don't drink anything. I just work and fix them and I try to do as many as possible. And uh, it worked out, I think, for me. I think it worked out for them, too, because there's a lot of wheelchairs that get done when I'm there. But there's a lot of <laughs> good organization. It really is. Yeah. 
Uh, I don't know for those who, who are listening that uh, Elliot is working in Jerusalem in the, in the headquarters, oh, which is huge, and uh, that they do, uh, you know, not only Jerusalem, but they also um, do things in the Jerusalem area. So, yeah, there's a lot of going on in, in that area. Thanks, Elliot. And how about you, Tzvi? Can you tell us a little bit about your, um, how your, um, you made your way to Yad Sara and what your current work is like? Yeah, well, I have been living in Netanya for about 40 years. I lived my first decade in Israel, I was in Jerusalem. Uh, I moved to Netanya when my parents were living here. They had made Aliyah a couple of years earlier. I opened a secondhand bookstore, which I ran until 10 years ago, 11 years ago, actually now. And eventually when I closed it, I realized I wanted to do something. I was still working at home as a translator that doesn't keep you busy all day long. Uh, so obviously this would be a good time in my life to give back to the community, as they say. And I had borrowed some equipment a few years earlier from my father in the months before he died. So I was aware, that was the first time I was really aware of Yad Sah, strangely enough, even though I've been in Israel for so many years. Um, and I decided it's around the corner from me. It seems like a very good organization. So I'll go and volunteer there. And I started and eventually, uh, as you mentioned, I have a lot of hats in the sense that because of my skills and so forth, um, I do various jobs there, which is very convenient. And it was particularly convenient during the uh, shutdown in the spring where for eight weeks, almost all the volunteers in Netanya weren't coming in. It was just, we didn't know what was happening and they were worried about their health, obviously. And so basically I worked full time. Uh, I was at Yad Sala for six, for eight weeks, uh, six days a week in the morning and basically closed at four, although I was in the middle of the day. But half the time that I went home, I ended up having to come back because I'd get a phone call about something that the inexperienced volunteers were working at noon, didn't know how to solve. So I spent a lot of time. <laughs> But that was fine. It gave me something to do while everybody else was bored. Uh, <laughs> I was busy every day. I, th I mean, for me, it was a gift. Wow. That's, a, that's great. That sounds so interesting to uh, hear. And we'll talk more about some of those things. I, I, I'd like to swing back to, to Leia a little bit. And then each of you can follow up in terms of the kinds of populations that you serve. Uh, so Leia clearly is in a unique place where um, you probably don't have as many Anglos as they have in Netanya and in Jerusalem, for example. <laughs> so tell us a little bit about the kinds of people that you serve in Yerocham and the kinds of services, you know, what uh, they're like and what kind of services that they, they need. Um, so the population of Yerocham is uh, an aged population. There's a lot of um, retired retired people and a lot of people who are who receive some kind of uh, um, nursing care um, there's quite a large elderly Russian population um, as well as various uh, immigrants from North America and from uh, um, from Iraq and those kind of countries that they they maybe made Aliyah in their in their 60s or 80s and uh, some of them actually don't have wonderful Hebrew and you, it's interesting what you said about the Anglos because actually there's a one specific type of person that comes to Yad Sarah that's normally very happy that there's an English speaker there. And those are the, the foreign care workers that we get quite a lot of. Um, so when there's a, a Filipino care worker or an Indian care worker, they tend not to speak Hebrew more than maybe a few basic phrases, um, but they'll normally speak English. And they're so thrilled when they come in and they can communicate with me. Um, so that's actually very nice. Um, mm -hmm. So we, we mostly solve, serve those older populations with that, the, the classic sort of Yad Sarah's walking, walking sticks and chairs and things. Um, and there's also a younger population which has moved into the new housing developments and they're always delighted to kit out with uh, breast pumps and their uh, cots and things like that. Mm -hmm. And obviously the, the, the community which doesn't live in Yorokhan but rather in their neighboring sand dunes are the Bedouin population. Um, they tend not to speak very much Hebrew or English, um, and I don't speak a word of Arabic, but we, we find ways to communicate. 
in fact I had um a couple of weeks ago I was in the just in our branch of Yad Sarah I think doing paperwork and there was a knock on the door someone had seen me through the window which happens uh, I'd, I'd locked the door because I wasn't accepting clients and there was a knock on the door it's a young uh, Bedouin boy I knocked on the door and he was holding the most gnarled walker you've ever seen it's supposed to have four wheels I had three it was <laughs> the top of it was about 45 degrees it was uh it was a piece of work it looked like he'd been under a tractor frankly and his father I guess was uh had his was leaning out the window of a car of the car outside there and was yelling at his I guess son in Arabic and the son was trying to explain to me he wants he wants to swap the walker for a new one <laughs> You know, this like, flat piece of metal. He wants to swap it for a new one. <laughs> so I said, okay, how, you know, give me all details. Let me look you up in the system. Maybe there's something I can do to help you. And I'm trying to communicate with this poor kid who doesn't speak Hebrew. And his dad's yelling at him out the window like it's his fault. And I understand the dad then gets out the car to come and see what he can do. And this poor guy, he couldn't walk. He needed the walker. Oh, um wow. And uh, it's difficult because I didn't really have any communication to explain to them the situation and to work out what I could do to help with them. Um, mm -hmm. And actually, the way that we resolved the situation was I, I know a couple of local donors who are normally happy to help when we've got serious situations. And I gave them a new walker and I called up one of those donors and they were totally happy to cover the 100 shekels. So oh. this man who needed a walker walked off with a walker and uh and his bill was fitted by a generous uh, local folk great that's a great story yeah uh, i'm sure you have others uh that's a good one um and and elliot um you were mentioned earlier uh when we were chatting uh, that you don't get to see clients all that often but but when you do who who, who are the clients that you're likely to see it's very rare that i see clients at all what normally happens if we see a client, it's somebody who has a wheelchair that broke and they really, really need the wheelchair. And we had one where a young couple came in. He had probably, from what I understood from my limited Hebrew, he had been injured in the army. And you see, the, they must have been 26 and 28 and he's in a wheelchair. And it's a terrible thing to see anybody in a wheelchair. And they, when somebody comes in like that, they have to give it to somebody to fix. But the person has to be able to speak Hebrew. Now, mm. I really don't. So there's a few people there. But remember, the volunteers in Jerusalem, many of them are in their 80s. <laughs> They're not. So I, I feel great because I'm only 69. So I'm a kid, the way these people. But one guy, I got down on the floor because he didn't get out of the wheelchair. I fixed the wheelchair on the floor with him in the wheelchair. Wow. And eventually I got it fixed and then the, they were able to leave. But we really, every once in a while, we'll get a client that comes in. Like you said, what, like Leah said, they don't speak Hebrew. So I get every once in a while, you get somebody who only speaks English and they come in with walkers. And the walkers normally, if you've ever been to Florida, you know, they split tennis balls and they put the mm -hmm. tennis balls on the walker. And that's how they push the walker. But Yad Sara has plastic pieces, which I think you can get in other places that you stick on the bottom of the walker. So when they come in and they only speak English, I explain to them, instead of splitting a tennis ball, get those pieces. I think they're five shekel a piece or something like that and put it on. And then you can go wherever you want. So every once in a while I do get, but it's very, very rare that we get the clients. And, mm -hmm. but it's, when you get it, something like I get, it really, it can bother you the rest of the day and longer. And it still bothers me. But uh, I did the best that I could and they left. They were able to go out and the wheelchair worked. Yeah, so, well, you did a good for him. And uh, so do you fix anything other than wheelchairs? Very rare. In other words, if they have something that they, nobody else wants to fix and they'll give it to me, I, Every once in a while, I'll get somebody, also somebody else came in and they wanted to take something apart and they didn't have the proper tools for it. So I, they looked at me, so I went over and I looked at it and I had to put my glasses on to see this. And I, I made a tool, I combined two tools to open whatever they wanted to open and then I handed it to the guy and I said, here. And he looked at me because nobody could open it because they needed a special tool that they don't have. 
But I, I remembered from years ago how I did it, you know, when I needed it in our car and I just did it that way. It wasn't that easy, but it wasn't that hard. And, mm -hmm. but that's really, that's, that's what I do there. I come up eight o'clock in the morning and I leave at 12 and I don't do anything other than that. And uh, most of the time I don't even take a drink of water, which is really not a good <laughs> idea. But right. uh, Especially for me, it's summer. Okay. Yes. Well, well, they have air conditioning. I don't know. If, I don't know if Yerucham has air conditioning, but we have air conditioning. That's a good story. <laughs> <laughs> you want to hold on to it till we give God see his chance, and then you'll come back to the AC story. I'll make a note. <laughs> so, Tzvi, tell us a little bit about Natanya. What kind of people come to uh, ask for Yad Sara for services there? What kind of challenges and and uh, pleasures do you have? Okay, one thing. Um, fortunately, I have I, my my he, my level of Hebrew is very, very good. I speak English, uh, or as I I joke to the British people who come in, I speak American, but I can understand you. Um, <laughs> and I also speak French, which is a tremendous advantage in Natanya because after the Hebrew speakers, there are the Russians, and after them, the French. We don't have all that many English speakers, relatively. Mm. We have a huge number of French speakers. A lot of them are sufficiently recent immigrants that they either don't speak Hebrew or their Hebrew is very spotty, so they're very pleased when I can actually converse with them. Mm -hmm. But uh, one thing, I was the first person in our branch, and still almost the only one, the first time I was able to use Google Translate on my phone with Russians. And... Uh, it was wonderful. I use it all the time now when somebody comes in and they're Russian and the, 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 at that particular shift, there happens to be nobody who speaks Russian. So I solved the problem that way. Clearly and in complete sense, it is a wonderful, wonderful tool. It's amazing. Hmm. Well, that's a creative solution for sure. So I'm glad to hear about Russian because I know um, Many people criticize Google uh, in other languages, like like even Hebrew. Um, but anyways, um, let's get back to Leah. I'm intrigued about this AC story that you wanted to tell. Um, why don't you share with us what happened? So a couple of years ago, um, we needed more space in our branch. And there, it was either to completely move the location or to put up a, a temporary structure next to next to where we're, we're located um the temporary structure in hebrew we normally call it a caravan but it's more it's more than a caravan that you'd camp in it's a it's a it's a room anyway so we the local council agreed to have this caravan put in place for us and um when our volunteers heard about it they said that's fine that's lovely but it needs air conditioning it needs air conditioning um and that was kind of expensive and we worked out what to do and actually our uh, friends in miami um got together did the fundraiser and we we they installed the air conditioning to fit out the place and that was must have been october time like two weeks later it started pouring in the desert for a cup for a week straight it poured <laughs> and the entire caravan flooded we've been so busy <laughs> thinking about the air conditioning because you know, it's the desert that we forgot that sometimes it rains. <laughs> Whole thing flooded. It turns out the roof hadn't been waterproof. And anyway, we had air conditioning. Didn't quite have <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Yes, the best laid plans, right? Mm -hmm. That is a good story. Um, so I, I guess the next the next thing that I'd, I'd like to, uh, you know, ask each of you to think about uh, one incident uh, with, you know, Elliot was telling us about the story about the young man who was in a, a wheelchair and how it stayed with him. Um, and perhaps you can each uh, tell us a, a story about a, a, a particular person or family that you worked with that made a particular impact on you um, and your work in Yatsara. So, so Tzvi, do you, do you have any story that comes to mind about a particular family or individual that, um, that you worked with? Well, I would like to uh, tell a story that happened to me quite a few years ago. 
one of the lessons I learned at Yad Sara, which I very much have taken to heart, and fortunately my manager has always backed me up about it. I was, it was explained to me when I was new there that despite the fact that any organization has to have rules and procedures, and that's very important, nevertheless, we should always remember we are there first to serve the public and then to, fill, to obey the rules. And therefore, there are times when you have to bend the rules. Mm -hmm. And uh, one case, again, I've, I've done it a number of times, but one case that was particularly extreme at the time, uh, for a long time we had a problem. If a person who is not who does not have an Israeli identity card comes to borrow equipment, they pay a higher deposit on the equipment. And then we always return the deposits by bank transfer. Well, that's a problem for a tourist who doesn't have a bank account in Israel. And a person, a couple came in on a Friday, they needed a wheelchair just for Shabbat. And at the time, the wheelchair deposit was about a thousand euro, a uh, thousand shekels for foreigners. But how would we give the money back to them? So I thought about it, and they were going to pay in euros anyway. They didn't have enough shekels. Um, and I said, "When are you going to return it?" They said, "Sunday morning." When are you coming in? About ten o'clock. And I said, "Fine. Give me the two hundred euros." We wrote nothing in the computer. I put the 200 euros in my pocket and went home. And on Sunday morning at 10, I went back to Yad Sara. And when they showed up, I handed them the 200 shekels. Uh, I said 200 euros, sorry. So yes. the, the point being, I solved a problem by breaking the rules. And mm -hmm. again, the important point, my manager accepted that as an acceptable thing to do because that's what Yad Sara is there for. Yes, well, that again is a creative solution to uh, or could have really prevented that couple from getting the wheelchair. So it's kala kavod. Yeah. Um, yeah, yeah. So uh, Leo or Elliot, do you have any uh, another uh, a, a, a instance where you helped a particular family or individual uh, that stuck with you and lesson learned or something of that nature that comes to mind? I don't work that much with clients because of what I do. Most of it's done, it's handled in another area. And the only other time that I remember is when a young girl came in missing a leg. That was also, you know, and she needed, her crutches were no good. And she's standing there and she's standing there. So I asked her if she wants to sit down. And I think she even got angry that I asked her if she wants to sit down, you know, but she didn't. And I took her crutches to somebody else who, I, who has all the crutches parts because I don't have any of those. He fixed it I, I, right on the spot and I handed it back to her and she went on her way. And, you know, it's, it ter again, it's a terrible thing. She must have been 23. And uh, it's a terrible thing to see that. And I don't know if I was supposed to do it. Like, like Svi said, I don't know that I was supposed to do that. I really didn't ask anybody what to do. I just took them gave him to another guy. He looked at me for a second and then he just put on whatever he had to put on and hands him back. I handed it to her and she left. I don't even know if there was supposed to be a charge, truthfully. So, I mean, I didn't ask, which was maybe yeah. not the right thing to do, but I didn't, you know, she's standing there and I felt, you know, I just felt sorry for somebody. Everybody's looking at her and, you know, it was not pleasant, but she mm -hmm. left and she seemed to be okay with it. Mm -hmm. I don't know how... I don't know where she went afterward, but she just left. But uh, you're but right, you're... Steve. You should have asked. No. I'll let, no, I'll let the right. two of you work that. Was that. Did right. <laughs> I think both your, both your examples give us a uh, pause that sometimes you have to take charge of the situation um, and, and deal with it when it happens. I think that's a good reflection on Yad Sara that they allow uh, the volunteers uh, to sort of use their judgment. And uh, it sounds that in your case, Elliot, that you did the right thing. You didn't want her to just stand there uncomfortable and not getting the service. So no harm, like Svi said, probably your master would have approved, right? 
Yeah, well, they're very nice. Have, yeah. They're very nice. I tell you they are. They're very nice. And Leah, I know you've already told us a few things about your place, but is there any particular family or individual that a uh, story of a, that either a, a one shot deal or something that went on for a while that uh, reflects Yad Sara's compassion and uh, service? Um, I think I could probably bore you all night with stories, but um, I'll tell you we one story <laughs> actually about um, one of our volunteers. So those of you who are very familiar with Yadzara might know that one of the um, ways in which Yadzara is different than other volunteer organizations is it puts a big emphasis on giving back to its volunteer base. Um, it will put on social events for its volunteers, um, sends, people, you know, sends everyone an email on their birthday and a card at Rosh Hashanah. It makes people feel like they're really valued and, and connect, helps connect people together when otherwise they might uh, be more isolated. Um, so we had a volunteer who unfortunately passed away recently called Shaul. Um, Shaul turned up though on our first big recruiting drive we did for volunteers. He said, I want to help. What can I do to help? I said to him, are you good with computers? Would you like to, would you like to help us lend out equipment? He said, no, I can't use a computer. I said, okay, are you good with your hands? Can you help us with credit equipment? Don't know how to use a spanner, I'm sorry. I said, okay, well, let me have a think about it. <laughs> um, and the truth was, I couldn't really find somewhere that he would fit in. But he said to me, I really want to help. I'll come, I'll come on the first shift and uh, I'll see what I can do. So sure, come, great. Anyway, it turns out that Shaul was fantastic at making people feel comfortable um, taking the equipment that they needed. People are so embarrassed when they come to take their first walking stick because in their minds, they're still 18. Why do they need the walking stick? Um, especially if they come to take more kind of personal equipment like um something that might help them in the bathroom and those kind of things. People are really embarrassed. Um, and Shaul was wonderful at talking to them, making sure they were taking all the equipment that they needed. Sometimes people take a walking stick when really what they need is the whole walker to cling on to. Um, and he would talk them through that process and he would call them afterwards, check it was going well for them. He was amazing at it. Um, and he loved it. He used to wear his uh, Yad Sara name tag the whole day. If he, had a, if he had a shift on a Wednesday, he'd wake up in the morning, put on go to the supermarket, come home, go out to the old age club, come home at five o'clock, he would walk up at the outside, been wearing it all day. He loved it. Mm -hmm. um, one day I got a phone call from his daughter. Um, his daughter needed to do a series of chemo treatments. And she said that she really needed her dad to come and look after the kids um, after school. And I said, uh, I'm sorry to hear that, but what's that got to do with me? <laughs> and she said, well, the thing is my dad volunteers at Yad Sarana Wednesday. And he says he just can't give that up. And I was wondering if it'd be possible that he could volunteer a different day of the week. Um, it, she knew how much it meant to her father. She couldn't ask him to, to stop. Um, he just, he really loved it and people loved him. Um, and, uh, and in the end of the way, uh, obviously we, we fixed the schedule so he could do that. And mm -hmm. uh, in the end, uh, when he passed away, he was on Inyad Tower on a Wednesday night. Um, and unfortunately, a couple of hours after he was there, he had a heart attack and, uh, mm -hmm. and passed away. But the entire team of Yad Sarah, um, was there at the funeral. And it was uh, a real testament to him how much, even though he couldn't use a computer and he couldn't fix the equipment and he couldn't do the bookkeeping, he was such a big part of Yad Sarah. He had given so much and it become such a big part of him. Um, yeah, well... Yeah. Um, yeah, that that the, that sort of segues into like some of the challenges that that we uh, that you no doubt have have encountered with the COVID uh, pandemic in uh, in terms of how you uh, provide services now and what new uh, you know obstacles and barriers may have been developing in the last six, seven, eight months that um, make your work a little bit more challenging than it had been in, in the past. So um, I, as I said earlier, when we were preparing, I really can't keep up with who's, you know, what the situation is in Israel in terms of lockdown or partial um, opening, but uh, just generally speaking, how has COVID changed your work or ha ha hasn't it? 
Elliot, I, why don't you start since you are uh, somewhat unique? In Jerusalem, it was closed. My section of Yad Saro was closed. I went up there when I thought it would be open. I was able to get into the building. I went up to the floor that I normally work on and it was dark. Mm. So I, since I don't take the buses now. So I called my wife on the cell phone. I said, turn around and come back and pick me up. But I got a phone call this week that they're open. So they want me to come in. Uh, I have something to do this week, so I can't. But and when it was open, when they stopped the first, after the first close, okay, I went in and like Svi said, I wore, I wore an Argamon mask, which is a very heavy mask. And I, and, and I didn't take it off the entire, four hours, like on an airplane, which I haven't been recently, but it's like when you go on an airplane with a heavy mask. And when I wanted air, I went downstairs outside and I got air, but it's harder to work. You know, especially if you're, you know, I'm, I'm, I'm trying to open something. I bought my own tools, so it's a little bit easier for me. Okay, they don't have certain tools that I used to use. So I actually, when I was in America, I went to Home Depot and bought some stuff I needed. So, but it's not, it's not simple for anybody there right now, I don't think. Have you seen, you know, do you think that the number of uh, wheel, people who need wheelchairs has gone down since people are staying home more? I don't know. It's possible, yes. But it's funny that you just asked that because now, you know, when I used to walk in the street in Brooklyn and I would hear a car, I would say, oh, that's wrong. Now I look at wheelchairs totally differently than I ever did in my whole life. I look at a wheelchair and I'll tell my wife, I said, Karen, that wheelchair has got a problem in the right wheel. And she'll look at me and she says, you know, you're really crazy. But it happens to me. Now I look at wheelchairs much, much, more, much differently. I know mm -hmm. which ones are which and the problem is I had a couple of friends that had to be in wheelchairs and they picked the wrong wheelchairs and I didn't want to say to them like you said like Leia said this guy would have told them no 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 that's not good for you you need that one because certain people are small and certain people are big and there are different wheelchairs for different people and it makes a big difference to the person pushing also right. so all right and, and Leia, have you, have you encountered any new challenges, barriers, or, or maybe opportunities uh, since COVID and the, the various lockdowns? Yeah, I'm, I mean, not to be too negative, but frankly, it's been an absolute disaster. <laughs> Our volunteers are mostly older folk um, who haven't wanted, uh, I mean, I mean, totally fair, they haven't wanted to carry on coming out to volunteer during the lockdown. Um, and we have uh, four amazing brothers that volunteer with us, uh, teenagers, and they've got a younger brother who's a uh, highly vulnerable, so they've stopped coming. And we're basically running on three volunteers for the last couple of months. But I'll tell you what we've managed to do to, to make it work out is that we've given all of those volunteers who aren't able to leave their homes all of the other jobs. So those of us who can go out only do the giving out equipment and we make sure that everyone else has got a job to do at home. Um, Cause also that helps people feel like they're still, you know, valuable, still giving back to society even though they can't get out of the house. Mm -hmm. So one person arranges for people to come in. Another person makes the phone calls to people to give back equipment. Another person has been sending out letters for us. Um, just keeping everyone involved like that. But yeah, it's been really, really hard. Um, and we've seen people showing signs of having um, less access to healthcare resources. We had someone coming in for a bottle of, uh, you know, a thing of oxygen every two days or so. Um, and I assumed it was a corona case. And then when I spoke to the woman, she actually said that her daughter was asthmatic and they were too scared to go to the doctor because of what was going on. So she decided to give her oxygen at home. And being a pharmacist, I know that that's, you know, that's not the right treatment. Mm -hmm. And we were able, like, I was kind of able to catch it at that level. Um, but people, um, people's safety nets have kind of been pulled out from under them, all those kind of checks and balances that normally go on. And I think it's made Yad Sarai for more important because people are coming only to us to access healthcare. And so we need to even be, be more on it than we'll make sure we're having full conversations with the people, checking out what's going on with them. Are they, you know, is it one person who's now taking care of four elderly people at home and that maybe 
they need a lot more help with that and we can do something um because uh the setups people had just don't exist anymore mm -hmm. it's really hard. yeah and and Svi, you spoke a little bit about your expanded role during uh covid now you're wearing many more hats are there any is there anything else that's happening in natanya uh that's unique about the covid not pandemic really. not really that first eight weeks when the country was shut down for the first time, and we didn't know exactly what was happening. And we were, uh, you know, masks, not masks, uh, gloves, not gloves. Um, that was the period that was challenging and interesting uh, together. But since then, things have settled down to a very similar to routine to what it was previously. And even this recent shutdown, um, most of the volunteers did come in this time. Mm. So we're a little Good. bit shorthanded, but we've been running full full days, three shifts a day, which is our normal uh, work mm -hmm. in Yatsara. Um, and they haven't had to call me for lots and lots of extra shifts. Unfortunately for me, fortunately for Yatsara and for the population. That's good. That's good to hear. Um, I have a, a little bit, I'm going to pose a little bit of a, a uh, not a challenge, but a scenario. Let's say we, we the, the four of us were given an assignment to, to market uh, new messages to Yad Sara uh, to, to get people to volunteer and to support Yad Sara. And we were, uh, we were like thinking of like, what are the one or two messages or four messages from each of us that we want most likely to push out? to everyone um, on this call and also in general, what are the key messages that we would want everyone to know about Yad Sara, either generally speaking or specifically for these times now? So what kinds of messages would you want us to release? Yad Sara is, it, I didn't know this, but Yad Sara is in almost every hospital in Israel from what I understand. So if you need something on the way out of the hospital, you find the Yatsara office and you can go there and you can tell them I need a wheelchair. And I don't think they ask too many questions. Maybe like she said, they need a two dot say hood and you get what you need. And I don't think that Yatsara, I, I just think they just do it. And there's no questions and there's no, you know, a lot of times when you want a wheelchair, you want something, especially in the United States, it's like trying to pull teeth. Here, you have this organization that does this for nothing, basically, and you get it. You get what you need. You need a wheelchair, you get a wheelchair. They have downstairs in, in the Jerusalem uh, or the Jerusalem building, when you walk in, they have a setup of an entire a hospital bed, almost everything that somebody could need. So you know that you can get it there. You walk in, you ask somebody, they tell you where to go, who to speak to, and it gets done. It's it's very very nice, you know. Mm -hmm. People are acting like this. It's, so, it's Elliot, very... are you are you indeed saying that that before someone's discharged from a hospital, there's somebody on site to help them get ready to there's go home? There's an office. I believe there's an office in the hospital that you could go downstairs to, and you can get it, and you can get a wheel. I didn't know that, but one of my friends needed a yacht, saw a wheelchair, and her husband went crazy. He didn't know what to do. And then I mentioned it to somebody in Yatsara and he says, they have them in every hospital. You just go ask where the Yatsara office is and you can go get it. And that's what happened. But not everybody knows this, but it's, it's a very, very good thing. I mean, I, mm -hmm. I like, one of the reasons I like going there and I like doing this is because like I'm doing this, the person who gets the wheelchair that I inspected, repaired and cleaned and sent out doesn't know who did it. And to me, that's, you know, like I'm just doing something for somebody that I'll probably never meet. I mean, when I see a wheelchair on the street, even though I look at it, I don't know that I fixed it. I mean, there are thousands upon thousands of wheelchairs out there. So, mm -hmm. I mean, it's, it's, it's really, it's a great organization. It really is. They deserve support and it's very nice. Mm -hmm. I, I, you know, I don't know what else to say. Well, that you just gave, uh, just uh, said something that that's not well known, you know, which is great that uh, Yad Sara is in every hospital and you don't have to wait to go to the, to the, no, no. One minute, Sweet. one minute. Sweet says no, Sweet, Sweet says no. Sweet says no, no, no. no. no, no. It's in a few hospitals, 
but I don't, I think it's a very small number of hospitals. And like everything to do with Yad Sara, if someone has the initiative to go to a hospital and set up a branch, mm -hmm. one will be set up. Uh, you know, ask Leah <laughs> about setting up a new branch somewhere. But I know that in Netanya, our big hospital in Netanya is, does not have a uh, branch of Yad Sara. So people wow. have to go from there to us. Um, and as far as I know, in Tel Aviv, with all the hospitals there, only one, I think only Bellinson has a branch of Yad Sara, if I'm not mistaken. Mm. So I don't think it's quite as common as you're as you think, no. oh, where it is, maybe, it has to be maybe very convenient. Maybe yeah. maybe it's oh, in Jerusalem. Maybe it's Jerusalem. Maybe it's Jerusalem. I wouldn't be surprised. Well, in any event, um, I see a note here that there are Yad celebrations uh, in 11 hospitals. Um, so ah, there 11. are opportunities okay. for those who want to uh, break in. Well, that's a good uh, one. Can, I like that. There are additional opportunities in a number of different hospitals, it sounds, uh, throughout Israel, which sounds really uh, like an excellent idea. So people have everything they need before they get home from there. Um, and how about how about you, Tzvi? I mean, if you were um, saying what's the one message that we'd like to get out to everyone about the uniqueness uh, of something special and un maybe unknown about Yad Sara, what would that be? Well, it depends. If you're talking about to the Israeli public, I would say that there are still many, many people in Israel who aren't really aware, aren't really aware of Yad Sara. As I say, I wasn't until my mm -hmm. father needed equipment about 12 years ago. I've been here over 50 years. But for most of those years, I wasn't aware of it. Uh, I didn't need it. And uh, nobody mentioned it to me. Somehow it never came up. Um, mm -hmm. So that's certainly something that is worth mentioning, though... I, as an aside, I did read more than once that approximately half the families in Israel have been helped by Yad Sara at one time or another, Whoa. which is a stunning uh, statistic. There can't be another Absolutely. charity in this planet that half the population of a particular country has been helped by. Mm -hmm. All right. And if you were making a message to uh, those of us who are not in Israel, what would that be? Same message or something a little different? Well, just to, uh, to expand on the same message a little bit more, we at Yad Sara, when somebody walks into the door at Yad Sara, it doesn't matter who they are. They can be Israeli citizens. They can be tourists. They can be uh, diplomats, uh, caregivers, um, Palestinians who have a right to be in Israel, some of them do. Uh, we give you whatever equipment you need. You pay a deposit, but we never, it's a completely nonpartisan organization set up by a docs man, but it is a very non, as I say, it's, it's a completely open organization. We just treat everybody who walks in the same way. And I think that's something very positive and I'm very proud of it. Absolutely. Part of it. Absolutely. Leia, do you have anything to add to our campaign of messages? Um, uh, I think that Elliot and Svi have really covered beautifully um, the heart of Yatsara. Um, since I know that there's a lot of uh, uh, folks who uh, live uh, outside of Israel on the call tonight, I would say that volunteering for Yad Sarah is one of the best ways to learn Hebrew. Um, mm. I could definitely teach someone how to use uh, uh, crutches way before I could do my su supermarket shop in Hebrew. Way before, months before. Um, <laughs> and even today, there are some things that I like, some like kind of complicated vocabulary and stuff I only know because. Uh, because my Hebrew developed uh, in a branch of Yad Sarah. Um, so those are people who may be thinking about spending, uh, spending time in Israel and wondering if, that, if they could volunteer um, and that Hebrew might be an obstacle, they could come and they would learn. Mm -hmm. Leia is right. Idea. Leia, you're right, because in, in Yerushalayim, 
many, many times you get volunteers from all over Europe and the United States, they come in and they help to do certain things, whatever they can do. In my area, basically they, they'll clean the wheelchair before I fix it or something like that, but uh, it works out and anybody can come in there. It's very nice. Mm -hmm. I don't even know if there's a guard on the door, truthfully. When I went there, what? <laughs> no, there's a guy. He's in, one minute. He's a receptionist. He's not a guard. He just sits there. Mm -hmm. And this, they even use people. There's a guy who sits there. And if you think he's a guard, and if you look closely, you'll see that he's in a wheelchair. Mm -hmm. I don't know. I, you can't be a very, a very physical guard if you're in a wheelchair. So I'm not sure <laughs> if they even have that. Could, could be, could be. Um, so um, we're kind of headed towards the, uh, towards the last part of our, our session. It's been ex very exciting and informative. And I think that one of the uh, things that uh, we've heard here in terms of giving back to the community and uh, getting specific skills and uh, feeling uh, uh, that you're doing a mitzvah and all that stuff, um, how could each of us um, emulate some of these uh, feelings and attributes in our own lives? I mean, clearly we could all, um, yeah, you know, some of them have already been said uh, in terms of opening up your own chap, you know, your own branch somewhere. But short of those kinds of uh, commitments, uh, you know, what other uh, ways can individuals or groups of individuals emulate the, um, the mission and objectives of uh, Yad Sara in their own communities, whether it's in Israel or, or out, out of Israel. Is there anything in, you can think of that we can all take back individually that we can do in our own lives? I would oh, say that, uh, sorry, Elias, okay. go ahead. No, go ahead, good. I'm just thinking, I can't think so much. Yes, you're better than I am at that. Go ahead, Leah. Um, I would say that one of the incredible things that Yad Sara does is that it knows not just to solve the, the problem as it seems at a surface level, but to go deeper and, and help with the root of the problem and all kinds of, all kinds of uh, inconveniences that you might not think about. And so, I, as for example, those of you who uh, might not know, for example, Yad Sara runs a service where people who, uh, who soil um, their bed linens that they're volunteers from Yatsar who pick them up and launder them for those families. Um, because it's just, you know, when you've got an elderly or unwell person at home, it's just another thing to deal with. Whereas if a volunteer can come and take that off your plate, that's that's a huge thing. Um, and that's just one example of that, that those kind of side um, things that Yatsar does just to help people. And so, you know, in our day-to-day -day life, you know, sometimes we know someone who needs a bit of help with someone, something. So you off, you say, oh, do you need anything? Can I help with something? But really to ask and really to think about what kinds of problems might that be, person be having and what can I do to just take one thing off their plate? That's, that's wonderful. I think we could all think of at least one of those. That's a good one. Uh, Sui, do you have anything uh, that you can share? Yes, um, there is in our, in the, our town of Natanya, a woman who runs a falafel stand who gives out uh, equipment and children, uh, clothing and such. And we often refer people to them who come in to us for something that we don't have. And we give them her phone number and tell them where, she, where she's located, where her falafel stand is. And she's doing this purely as a good act to the community, which I think is the, so is the sort of thing you were talking about. And of course, to remember the fact that Yad Sara was created by a man who basically did the same thing 40, what was it, 45 years ago, 35 years ago. He started just giving out, he had some equipment and he started lending it to whoever needed it and it grew and grew mm -hmm. and grew and grew. But when he started, it wasn't an organization. It wasn't a massive uh, charitable, uh, I don't know, uh, empire. Right. Right. Um, yeah, and Elliot, do you have any um, anything that you'd like to add? What what uh, what Leia said was she's right. It, it, but it's you have to identify the problem that somebody else has and try to help them. And you should really do it quietly. 
because you don't want to, many of these, many people that are like this, they're embarrassed about it. And you have to like ask, you know, in a certain way. And sometimes that's not particularly easy to accomplish, but sometimes it does work. You know, like mm -hmm. when you ask somebody, why don't you sit down and they don't want to sit down. It's, you know, and they should, it's not so simple, but uh, mm -hmm. whatever. But Yatsar again is a terrific organization. It really yeah. is. I, I wanted to just, you know, personally, first of all, thank you all for those stories and to underscore some of like the small gestures can go a long way. Uh, what each of you have said in different connotations is like going beneath the surface, as Leia said. And sometimes it's a, it's a phone call, a follow-up, as you said, sometimes a, a follow-up or trying to dig deeper or to look at things a different way um, can, can uh, help people know where you're coming from. Um, as Elliot is saying that you're, you're there for them and not for glory or anything else, but you're really all there for, for Ahavas Yisrael, which is, is really wonderful. Um, I think that we're just about, um, you know, running out of time now. So I, I just thought that I would give you each an opportunity for some closing remarks. If you have anything you, that you didn't have a chance to say that you want to say or ask any questions to each other, since I've been asking all the questions, if you have questions for each other, we have a few moments. So I thought I would just open it up. Anyone? How do, how do you feel living in Yerucha? Um, I, I was there. I was there many, many years ago. And I went there to buy a transformer because there was a transformer factory there. And I was really, Patish is there, there, right? Not anymore. It's not there anymore, Patish? Whoa. That's <laughs> All right. But she did a great thing to open up, uh, to open up a, a place in Yerucham is a great thing. Mm-hmm, mm-hmm. Um, very hard. I actually just wanted to make a very short comment because I felt like it wasn't maybe clear enough about the work that Elliot does fixing, especially wheelchairs. So you might think that it's just something which helps like, um, just helps the funding of Yad Sarat, they don't have to buy so many new wheelchairs, which is I'm sure true, but you wouldn't believe the difference it makes to a family when their loved one is in a fully working wheelchair, when the brakes don't slide, when tires are pumped up. The difference between pushing a flat tire on a wheelchair and pushing a pumped up tire on a wheelchair, it's unbelievable. It makes it fun to take that elderly person out to the park as opposed to a full body workout. It's incredible the difference that kind of work can make. Um, and Elliot, if you want to come and volunteer with us, we love you. <laughs> <laughs> there you go, we have an invitation. Well, that's an excellent an excellent way for us to uh, to uh, uh, finish up on our, our, our chat today, uh, realizing that sometimes it's more to the story than on the surface and that there's more, uh, that your contributions are really very significant in many different ways. So, you know, on behalf of Yad Sarah, thank you, thank you Yad Sarah, uh, friends of Yad Sarah of America, uh, I want to thank each of you for taking time again and thank all of you who are uh, watching this and um, I don't think that we have any questions that are unanswered. So with that, I'll just say Shalom Lehitraot Bikarov and everyone take care and be safe. It was nice meeting everybody. Same here. Thank Thanks again. Bye. Thank Bye. you. You're welcome. Good.